Welcome back. As I was explaining in our last lecture, qualitative data analysis is a lens that allows us to see data more clearly. But even after we select the right lens, we need to consider how we can prepare our data to help us conduct our analysis properly and efficiently. First of all, we need to understand that the main determinant of what we're going to do with our data derives from our research problem. And it's vital that we keep that in mind as we're planning out a course of analysis. A well-designed study not only considers what we're trying to learn, but what sorts of analysis we'll conduct on our data to get us there. Ideally, we should figure all of that out before we collect data and build a plan for data collection and analysis before we proceed to field work. But even if we don't go to that level of rigor, we can still plan out how we're going to prepare our data once we collect them. For observational research, we generally work from notes, but for, for verbal data, we'll often need to determine how we're going to turn what we hear into something we can read and analyze. Here are a few different methods that we might use for preparing our qualitative data, particularly if they're verbal. So the first of these is a straight transcription, and that's where we're going to offer a full transcription of a qualitative interview or focus group session or ethnography, complete with pauses, grammatically incorrect prose, tangents, the researcher's questions, the researcher's interjections. We're often going to make that from a recording. And the advantage of having a transcript is we get a clear written record of any qualitative data collected that can be analyzed. So pretty much the only thing we're going to miss out on with a straight transcript are any um, nonverbal cues like uh, body language or uh, fidgeting or you know things like that. Um, but the drawback of a straight transcription is it's difficult to read and analyze, and it's often tedious to prepare and later reference. So normally transcription is hired out. Um, transcripts come back in a format that are not very pleasant to read and taking transcript data and turning it into something you can analyze takes a while and usually requires a lot of manipulation. So I actually favor something that we call a clean transcription uh, and this is where you offer a full transcription of a qualitative interview focus group ethnography focusing on research subject data and omitting filler or pauses and it's often again made from a recording. It might also be made in the moment. and Basically, what you're doing with a clean transcript is you're taking what was said, you're trying to preserve what was actually said as much as possible, but you're taking out all of the junk. So all the filler, all the tangents, all the ums and ahs and pauses, all the times where the researcher um, maybe interjected something to get someone to talk. You're filtering all that out in favor of something that is very readable when it's written. And it's also easier to code and categorize in a transcript when it's in that format. But the drawback is that First of all, because we're cleaning things up, dialects or manners of speaking that are not just captured in the actual words that are being used can be difficult to capture consistently. And there's also many different conventions for capturing non-grammatical features of speech that um, can make a clean transcript a little bit distant from what the actual data had to say. And so it's normally good to pair a clean transcript with recording clip reels or uh, audio clips or things like that so that you don't lose that flavor if it's present in your data. Another practice is note taking. And note taking is where instead of trying to capture exactly what was said, you capture the gist of what was said. And that usually involves key details from a qualitative interview or focus group session or ethnography that leaves out all the unimportant stuff, but preserves the verbal data as closely as possible. And if you can't do a clean transcript, note taking is generally a good method. Um, it's far more readable and easier to code and categorize than a transcript. It's also a lot quicker and easier to produce uh, if you're in a time crunch. But again, the flavor or the, of the response or context can get lost in translation because you're relying now on notes that are filtered through what the note taker thought was important and how they captured things and the words that they chose to leave in and, and drop out rather than what was actually said. And again, this method is really more useful for when you're in a time crunch and when you're going to pair it with other uh, forms of presentation than it is um, uh, as a pure method for data analysis. And then something else that we can use is speech re recognition software. And I like to use a program called Otter, but there are several different programs out there that are all good. And what's nice about the speech recognition software is that it can develop automated transcripts through software that recognizes speech and produces a computerized transcript that's usually timestamped and um, tied back to the audio so you can click on the timestamp and hear exactly what the audio said. And that, by the way, is a great deliverable if you want to give someone something that they can interact with. Um, it's very convenient. 
to use speech recognition software. And in fact, a lot of students uh, that have taken this class have used it in their IDIs or focus groups. But the drawbacks, I first find that the speech recognition software is not often accurate. It's good, but, but not great. And it usually has to be checked against a recording. So you still spend a lot of time going back and listening. It, it's faster than doing a straight transcript for sure. Um, and it can be faster than doing a clean transcript, but it still takes a lot of fiddling. And it doesn't generally distinguish between different speakers very well. So software is getting better at this, but uh, particularly with focus groups, I've found that speech recognition software usually has met its match once you get a group of any kind of size. It has tr trouble distinguishing people from one another. And so what you get instead are big blocks of text that are hard to read and hard to parse, and you have to go back and edit anyway. So the recognition software has a ways to go, but it is a tool. And again, uh, it's superior to note-taking in some respects. It's great paired with note-taking because then it can help you produce a clean, a clean transcript or better notes. Um, but usually on its own, it's not sufficient. One best practice I'll definitely recommend is for researchers to participate in as much of the field work as possible. Field workers are human beings, and it's easy for them to make mistakes in what they hear or what they write down. And maybe the field worker is actually a team of people. You have a note taker, and then you have someone that's actually doing the questioning. Um, the person that's doing the questioning is generally not going to take good notes, if any at all, while the note taker is going to be their sole focus. But if they get overwhelmed, uh, or if questioning goes off script, they may not get everything real well. So it's a good idea to have a video and an audio recording, uh, and that will often give you a record that you can go back to and, and fix any notes that are missed. But being present also allows for those mistakes to be minimized because the researcher can hear what's being said and develop a good contextual understanding of it. One example I can cite from my own career is that we used to have an interviewer who had been trained in writing shorthand and she would write abbreviations for common words. We were doing a lot of medical interviewing and there's a lot of jargon in medical interviewing and we didn't always know that her abbreviations weren't acronyms for something in the medical world. So we'd use her transcriptions to enter the data. And one thing that I remember particularly was she would put the, the, the acronym SVS, which meant service in her shorthand. But we didn't know that that was shorthand, and we just assumed it meant something in medical terms, something about service. And uh, it wasn't until a client actually asked us, what does that mean, that we realized we needed to talk to our interviewer about the transcription she was offering and get her acronym straight before we use them in our data. So making sure that those errors are not present in the data that you're ultimately sharing with your client can help you to avoid those embarrassing types of situations like the one I just referenced. There's also, um, in terms of how the actual analysis is conducted in qualitative research, uh, software. And many researchers either do the work by hand or they utilize simple office software like Microsoft Office or Google Documents. And in fact, at my office, we, we use Word and Excel for a lot and SPSS for a little bit. Many qualitative researchers don't use any sort of analytic tool beyond something basic. And I'll be honest in saying that I have yet to see any really good software for conducting keyword or sentiment analysis that has actually sped my analysis up beyond what I can do by hand. So if I have better processes that I've developed or better tools that I have internally than what is out there commercially, I'm not going to use the commercial tools. And that is exactly the case for me, and it's exactly the case for many other qualitative researchers that I've talked to. But there is some software out there. It's called CACDASC. C-A-Q-D-A-S, or Computer-Aided Qualitative Data Analysis Software. And some of the tools that exist in the CACDAS space are outgrowths of CRM platforms like HubSpot or from quantitative platforms like Qualtrics. And those are a little bit more commonly used by people that already have them as tools and think that they're, you know, they're going to go ahead and utilize them, or people that are quantitatively trained or CRM trained that already know how to use those tools. But there are also specialization programs, and just a few of the many out there would include things like MaxQDA, Quercos, Raven's Eye, FreeQDA, QDA Minor Lite, Connected Text, and Invivo. And these all offer different styles of qualitative data analysis. They all have their quirks. Some are, some are better than others for different things. Um, but I have found that while these tools are good for certain types of qualitative data analysis, they tend to be very poor at dealing with context. So when you get comments that 
really rely on a contextual understanding. They just don't cut it. They're not able to help you categorize things any faster than just doing it by, by hand. And many of these tools need to be trained with significant amounts of similar data to offer any real power and thus are better suited to open-ended questions from quantitative studies rather than qualitative analysis of focus groups or high context IDIs. The best tools help you to code data efficiently, but if you're not as interested in coding, a by hand approach using basic software is often sufficient. It's also worth asking though, what the client wants in your analysis before you go out and buy a bunch of software or license a bunch of software to try to do all of that. Once you've collected your data, something that you also need to be aware of is what to do with your personally identifying data that you collected, which may not be of any use for your research, but which, which was needed to complete the study or audit your work or provide incentives. The best practice is to discard these data if possible, particularly if there is personally identifying or sensitive information included. The next best thing is to ensure that your data are being stored securely and encrypted so that you don't have to worry about a malicious actor getting access to your research and revealing the name or personal details of a participant. Remember, Part of the ethics of marketing research involve keeping research participation private and confidential, and if promised, anonymous as well. If you don't need the information, get rid of it when you're finished with the research. Well, in our next lecture, we're going to talk about categorization and coding in more detail. See you there.